Hi, everybody. It's Professor Razy. I wanted to take a little time and go through the course syllabus for the fall 2023 semester of Phys 1400 Introductory Physics. We can do it now, uh, and you can just listen to me go through it. I'm going to go through it on the screen with you. That way, we don't have to spend a lot of time in class uh, trying to decipher what this all means. Uh, take your time. Go through this document, get a PDF of it, make sure you download it and keep that with you. And then you can watch this video and go through the syllabus with me. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can feel free to email me and the email address will be included in that uh, syllabus, which is already posted live at Brightspace and you can download it whenever you want. So let's go ahead and go through that document together. And when we're done with the syllabus, then we're going to go through the draft class schedule as well. So I'm sharing my screen here. Up it comes. Okay. So. This is what your syllabus for Phys 1400 should look like. Uh, every class that you get will have a similar document. This is called the syllabus. It's essentially a contract between the student and the instructor that explains exactly how the course is going to be offered throughout the duration of the semester. Every course at the University of Windsor is different. You cannot assume that what one instructor does is what all the others will be doing. They're all different. And so you need to make sure that you know the syllabus of your course specifically. So let's go through the one that I put together for you all this fall. Obviously, the time for the lectures, Monday Wednesday, Friday, 1130 to 1220 at total 100. Just know that I will start at 1130 sharp. I will try to get done uh, as close as I can to 1220, but I'm we're only together for 50 minutes three times a week, so I have to start on time. I would advise that you be in your seat and be ready to go at 1130. Uh, as said before, my name is Steve Razy. I'm a professor of physics. I'm the head of the Department of Physics, and my office is in 28. 8-2 Essex Hall. That's where you can find me. Uh, obviously, my phone number is here with extension 2656. A lot of you are going to want to try to email me. That's fine. Uh, if you do, please put Phys1400 in the subject line. Uh, if you do that, it's going to go to a special folder in my Microsoft Outlook, and then I'll look at those as often as I can. I'll be able to get back to you much more quickly. If you don't do that, it's possible I won't see your email at all, uh, and I might just miss it. So I'm going to keep reminding you, please put Phys1400 in that subject line if you want to get my attention on it. Uh, the course website is the University of Windsor's Brightspace page. So many of you, if not most of you, are new to the University of Windsor. You're going to have to learn how to use Brightspace. Probably every instructor is posting all of their materials at Brightspace. Um, so it's a pretty good, it's called an LMS, we call it a learning management system. Uh, it's a way that documents are posted uh, online and the way that we can communicate with you. Some of your instructors will actually be using it for assessment. They can have exams and quizzes embedded in the Brightspace. We're not doing that in my particular course, uh, but Brightspace is a very powerful and yet flexible learning management system that allows us to run our courses the way we want. Office hours. Right now, I have these three office hours designated. Uh, Monday, that's right after class. Thursday is a day that we don't have class, and Friday, an hour later after class. I try to stagger these things throughout the week. There is no good time when everyone is free. You have to realize that. So I picked three times that are not always the same every day. So depending on what your schedule looks like, hopefully you would be free one of those days. Now, required course materials. Yes, you are required to get a textbook. So the textbook this year is Physics for Scientists and Engineers, 5th edition by Douglas Giancoli, and that comes from Pearson. The cover looks like this. This is an ebook, so I've embedded the link in uh, the syllabus. It's right there. That's a clickable link. You can click on it and follow it. You have to get the ebook. And the reason you have to get the ebook is because this ebook gets included with a mastering physics license, which I'm going to discuss below. Uh, so it is an all electronic book. So there's no more carrying that big, heavy uh, book around. Uh, it's all included online, but through the Pearson site, my understanding is you can purchase an unbound three-hole punched version uh, in case you do want the, the paper copy of that. And you can do that by clicking on Pearson eText, purchase a loosely uh, printed textbook. So you do have to go to that site and buy it because what you're going to need even more important than the book is honestly, um, to get a good physics education, all you're gonna have to do is be able to master the homeworks and get through the exams and any good university, calculus-based university physics textbook books uh, will work. But what you will need is a mastering physics license. So required course material number two, a mastering physics license. 
all homework assignments, and that's going to comprise 15% of your grade, are going to be assigned, completed, and graded using Mastering Physics, which is a software package purchased along with your textbook. Yes, you must have a Mastering Physics license. You have to have it because that's how we're doing the homework. Um, this can be done in the bookstore or by purchasing it online directly from the book publisher, whichever you want. Uh, full instructions on how to get in line with Mastering Physics are provided on the next page, and I will go through that with you. Um, so Mastering Physics comes with the electronic textbook, and that's very useful. Uh, the, the questions for Mastering Physics are actually pulled out of the textbook assigned problems. So the book and the Mastering Physics uh, problems go together um, very closely. So that's why they're kind of bundled together. Here's another reason why you should get the book and Mastering Physics license. For uh, four physics courses taken by scientists and engineers are currently requiring the use of Mastering Physics using this book. So if you're taking Phys 1400 and you're going to take Phys 1410 in the winter semester, and that's what most scientists do, you're going to be using this book and a Mastering Physics license. Uh, if you're taking Phys 2100, so the engineers do not take Phys 1410 now, but they will be taking a new course next fall called Phys 2100 that will also use this book. And it will also use Mastering Physics. And some of the scientists uh, take Phys 2200, that's next fall, uh, also using this book and using Mastering Physics. So if you're required to take any of those courses, and that's going to be most of you, then you should really consider purchasing the 24-month access to Mastering Physics. That will be most economical for you. There's nothing wrong with just buying it for one three-month or six-month um, term. But if you know you're going to be using this again in a future class, I would suggest trying to save some money now and get the longer extended license. So engineers for sure are going to take a course this fall and next fall, which use that Mastering Physics and that book. So 24 month is going to make sense for you. Uh, for the scientists, you're going to need at least a one year access because you're going to need it for this fall and through the winter. And then a lot of you do wind up taking Phys 2200 next fall as well. So you might just want to look into that. You can always, if you only get a shorter license, you can always repurchase a new license for each individual course. You're just going to wind up spending more money in the long run. And I'd like to save you money if we can. Third required course material is going to be the laboratory manual. So you will all, you all are required to engage uh, in our laboratory sections. All students are going to be required to purchase and use a U Windsor Physics electronic ebook manual. So the manual is no longer PDF posting. There is an ebook that you'll have to uh, access and then purchase. And in that manual are the uh, experiments that we're performing each week and also pre labs that you're going to need to be uh, print out, complete, and turn in prior to entering the lab room. So as soon as that laboratory manual becomes available online, uh, I'll have I'll put out another video that shows you exactly how to do that. More on the lab is coming a little bit later in this video. So the second page of the syllabus is very clear instructions from Pearson. This is a document they provided to me, which is student registration instructions. How do you get online with Mastering Physics, what you need to do? So in the syllabus, there's a link right in there. You can click on that link. It takes you to the page that has been created, and it's linked to our course. So Mastering Physics is not just like a random a uh, Netflix license or something like that. This is a specific course that is uh, a page and that is tied to my site, right? So I'm the person designing all the questions for it uh, and it's linked to our course Phys 1400 here at the University of Windsor. So um, you're gonna have to sign in uh, with a Pearson student account, but for most of you, if you're first semester students, you're gonna have to create your own account. Uh, I believe chemistry uses mastering chemistry. Uh, so that's a very, very similar thing. So you're probably gonna need a Pearson account anyways. Anyways, the whole instructions are here on how you get online uh, and then how you pay for it. So like I said, you can buy it right there. Um, with a credit card or PayPal by linked directly through that website, or you can get uh, a license code from our bookstore. I honestly have no idea how much that costs at the bookstore. That'd be something you want to look um, uh, into a little bit and maybe contact them. Uh, so there are two ways that you can get online, either directly through the website, or if you go to our bookstore where you're going to buy your other books, uh, usually there would be a book and a piece of paper uh, wrapped in the cellophane of the book that has this this code that indicates you have paid for it. But now there is no more hard copy of the book, but when you go to the bookstore, they will sell you something that is your access to the ebook and this Mastering Physics. And then it tells you once you've created an account, once you've purchased your access to Mastering Physics, how do you sign in later? So you're gonna see these things. And anyways, it's all right there. So do please make sure that you do that. Okay. 
I heard a little ding in the background. I can't get, rid of, get rid of that. Okay, what's next here? So that was the second page, so from Pearson. All right, supplemental text readings. Um, yes, there are many excellent first year physics texts available. Most of them are very similar. Honestly, all the books are pretty similar. Every book you can find, free books in the library, uh, free books that your older brother or sister used when they were in university. It's a great source of new problems for you to try, new figures to look at, new discussion items to think about, whatever. Uh, maybe the book explains it in a slightly different way that you like, that's fine. So I think any textbook will do. We're using a textbook that's correlated with the Mastering Physics Online Assessment System, which we're using. So the Mastering Physics license has to be acquired to complete the required homework assignments. So the book and the Mastering are tied together. But if you want to get a hard copy and you can just get a free one, like again, from anywhere, from the library, uh, from anyone else uh, uh, that used to take this course, as long as you're learning the physics content and learning how to solve problems, you're going to do very, very well. But you will need that Mastering Physics license. Okay. Uh, here's my, our motivation for the course. So I'm just trying to provide an introduction to calculus-based university physics. It's a pretty standard course. It's the first semester of a standard year-long two-semester introductory physics course. Just like you're taking introductory chemistry, most of you, general chemistry one and two, first semester of a year-long course in chemistry. Uh, almost all the students in this course go on to a subsequent physics course or courses, usually physics 1410 in the winter. So you're going to be expected to learn physics, problem-solving methods, and become familiar with critical ideas of introductory physics and mathematics that you're going to use in subsequent classes. So that's really what our goal is here. Okay, let's get to the grading. So your course grade is going to be determined by your performance on two in-class examinations. So we'll call those the midterms, although they're not exactly in the middle of the term, but two in-class exams called the midterms, a final examination, this graded homework through mastering uh, physics, between class learning assessments through mastering physics, and your graded laboratory reports, which are required. So the overall course grade is determined on the basis of the following distribution. You can see that each midterm is worth 15%. So 15%, 15%, 30%. The final examination is 40% of your grade. So if you can do this much math, you'll see that 15 and 15 is 30 plus 40 is 70. 70% 70 of your final grade is the examinations. So you shouldn't be sweating all the small stuff. Every year when we teach this, there are students who are fixated about a point here on the laboratory or a point here on the, on the mastering physics. It's fine, you can obsess about those, but it's really small potatoes compared to the weight of these exams. 70% of your grade is the exams, obviously the most important part. So you've got to be working on getting ready for those exams. It's a full 70% right here. Okay, when you take the mastering physics assignments, the total mastering physics is going to be 15%. 15% is through the mastering physics, but we broken up the assignments you're doing into two types. There's graded homeworks through mastering physics, which are a little bit longer. They're kind of problem based. That'll be 10% of that 15% and or two thirds of the 15%, I should say. And then one third of the 15% or 5% of your grade is between class learning assessments. They're kind of also through mastering physics, but they might not always be direct problems that you're solving. They're kind of structured guided ways to like make you uh, think about the material that we've talked about in class. They might be thinking about the material we're gonna cover in the next lecture. Kind of like structured guided uh, ways of understanding what you're learning. So there might, they might be some kind of similar problems and things like that, but really they're not as uh, technical or even as long as the graded homework assignments. And then of course, everyone, everyone has to be enrolled in a laboratory section, which is 15% of your total grade. I'm gonna get more details on the laboratory sections coming up on a subsequent page. Okay, important dates that I know about right now. First day of class, Friday, September 8th. I'll see you all there. The last day to drop looks like Wednesday, October 4th. So we call this a VW. So it's actually the last day to drop with no financial penalty. So the last day to drop where you get your money back and that's called the VW is Wednesday, October 4th. Uh, midterm exam one, I have a question mark and a question mark on there. I have tentative dates. I'll fill those in when I'm absolutely sure about them, but I do have tentative dates and that'll be, well, I'll share those with you in the schedule, okay? I really don't expect those will change, but like just in case something happens in the next month and I have to change it, I, I leave it as question mark for now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we know when those will be. Uh, reading week, no class. That's already determined by the university, Monday, October 9th to Friday, October 13th. It always spans the Thanksgiving holiday in Canada now.
The final exam is determined by the registrar and is posted on October 15th. Yes, there will be a final exam. Yes, you have to be there for it. What happens when every year somebody says, oh, Professor Azy, my parents bought tickets to Hawaii and uh, we're leaving on uh, December uh, 15th and I see that the final is on December 18th. What can we do about it? And the answer will be nothing, nothing. You are responsible for being here for the final. It's posted by the university. I don't decide that. I don't pick the date. The university has a plan for all of this. That has to be the date when we do the final. No, I will not give you an early version of the final. No, there's nothing you can do if you're leaving town. You just have to wait until they pick a date. Do not make travel plans until you know when the finals for all your classes will be. What's going to be the format of the exams? Well, they're going to be a little different than probably exams you're used to taking in high school. The exams will be mandatory, and they are consist of work problems, conceptual problems, short answer questions, and reviews of comprehension, so idea and thought questions. Conceptual problems uh, require little or no calculation. All right, these are things that you should just know from working out the other problems that I'm going to assign, and it will help me evaluate your understanding of the material. All the exams will be multiple choice and completed on a Scantron bubble sheet. All right. So during the exam procedure, I'm going to hand out these bubble sheets. Uh, everybody will be writing them uh, in the classroom, and it's all multiple choice. And as such, there is no partial credit of any sort. The course is just too big, guys. We've got two sections of well over 200 people per section. There just is no way um, that we're going to be able uh, to grade uh, any work that you do by hand. So multiple choice questions have to be graded as all correct or all incorrect. And that's just the way it is. Um, so, uh, and I know people don't always like that, but uh, that's just what you're going to have to do. So if you need accommodation through the Student Accessibility Services, that can be offered uh, if you go to SAS and you need a, a verifiable, if you have a, need some help or assistance, uh, you have a verifiable medical or compassionate excuse. So you deal with SAS for all of that, and then you would write it in there during that time. That has nothing to do with me, uh, but do work with the Student Accessibility Services. These exams will be closed book. In class, you no books, no notes, no course notes, or anything. I'll give an equation sheet provided to you, but all of that comes from me. So when you show up for those exams, calculator and pencil, student ID, that's all you need. Due to the size of this class, there is no possibility for a makeup examination for missed exams. It just so if your car breaks down on the way to the exam, which happens when you have several hundred students, that'll happen every year. There's just nothing we can do about it. I cannot write a makeup exam just for you, all right? There's like 250 students in our section. That's just an unreasonable request. So if that happens, uh, we will do something to accommodate you and make it up by transferring the weight maybe to uh, the next midterm or splitting it up between the midterm and the final. So it's not like, you know, you necessarily, well, you might get a zero if you're just there for no reason, but if there's some documented way uh, that you had to miss it, maybe there's something we can do to work that out. You are going to need a standard scientific pocket calculator to complete the required assignments and to do the problems embedded in the examination. No calculator with any wireless communication, including smartphone, tablet, et cetera, may be used. All right, so just a regular pocket calculator um, that you used in any of your other physics classes, okay? Final exam. Final exam is mandatory. I talked about this before. The date and time are established by the university registrar and can under no circumstances be moved. It's just the way it is. We will not move the date or time of the exam. Uh, if the final exam is missed for any reason, the university approved day to make up the examinations is what the university calls the alternate final exam day. That's Thursday, December 21, 2023. 2023. That's already set up by the university. Um, if in the unlikely event that you have three or more final examinations scheduled or due in consecutive time slots over a 24-hour period, this is right from Senate Bylaw 54, you can request a supplemental examination day. You need to do that right away. So when the uh, exam schedules are released on October 15th, I suggest you look at the courses that you're taking, come up with a final exam schedule, because you have to apply for this relief no later than October 31st. So every year I have students coming into me as the department head saying, oh, we have two, three examinations within two days, and it's like, you know, December 4th, it's like the week before final exam period starts. It's too late. Yeah, it's too late. The Senate bylaws say we can help you and you're not required to write three exams uh, within 24 hours, but only if you ask for some alternate solution before October 31st. If you wait till November, December, it's just nothing we can do for you.
Okay, you are going to be using Mastering Physics. So the sooner you get your Mastering Physics license and the sooner you get on there and start doing uh, the solu the problems and things that I've set up, the better it will be. Um, so first off, for 5% of your total grade is between consecutive lectures, it's going to be small assignments. They take roughly 30 minutes each that will involve concepts in the class we just had or serve as connective tissue with the lesson we're about to have. So I call these between class assessments and they're going to be 5% of your total grade. And then once we finish a chapter, there's going to be larger, more cumulative assignments given throughout the semester. And you'll have approximately one week to work on these after they're available. And that, that's the homework. And that's worth about 10% of your grade. So the between, between class assessments will have shorter due dates because I expect you to have done them between the classes while it's fresh in your mind. The homeworks are usually once we finish a chapter, then I'll like give you a week to do on it. Okay. Um, both of these online graded assessments comprise what I think arguably the most important part of the course where a significant amount of your learning will take place, all right? Doing well in the homework is a good indicator of understanding and correlates very high with your exam performance. How are you expected to do well on a physics exam if you're not doing well on the homework, all right? It's not gonna be sufficient to merely attend class and look over my lecture notes if you wanna do well on the examinations. The ability to accurately and quickly solve problems and to truly understand the concepts involved can only be obtained by practicing on graded homework. And that's the ability which we'll be testing for during the examinations, right? An examination is not how good can you describe what you read or what's your impression of the subject. No, the examination is a 50 minute window where I'm gonna assign you a bunch of questions and without access to the internet, without access to your notes, without asking your friend for help, can you do well on those problems? All right. Uh, if anybody's worried about the exams, I have some documents posted on Brightspace. It's called Tips for Succeeding in Introductory Physics. There's a ton of tips there. There's lots of help you can get, but the, the work has to be done by you. There's no other way around it. You have to do the work and understand those problems yourself. And to do this, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, it's worth stating specifically, do not cheat on the homework. All right. And I know people are going to be inclined to do that. And probably some of you will. And that means that you're doing this mastering physics. How do we know that it's you doing it? What if you're sitting with a friend and he or she is telling you what the answers are? Well, one, that's a violation of academic integrity, which I consider a serious academic effect offense for sure. But most importantly, you're not going to get anything out of the course if you do. So remember, the homework is only 15% of your total grade. The exams are 70%. So if you think cheating on mastering physics to like bump up your grade uh, allows you to receive a good homework grade, that's okay. If you make that decision, I think it's a bad decision, but fine. But most likely, you're going to wind up with very low exam grades and a low final exam grade. And that's basically what it's about. We're not making you do it just to do it. That is the place where you are learning how to do problems. And that's what I'm assessing you on. But I know students oftentimes don't take that online homework seriously. They just see it as a way to cheat their way through the course. Fine. You know, get your 15% and then on the exam, you're probably going to fail. And I've honestly seen that every single semester. So it's just not a good idea. You've got to take the homework seriously. If you can do that well on your own and quickly, you are perfectly set up for the exam. And then you really shouldn't have to worry about it. Let's get on to the lectures three times a week for 50 minutes. Uh, attendance at my lectures is not required. OK, just so you know, in fact, if you don't want to attend and if you don't think you can be there and participate in the class, please feel free not to attend. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy having people in the class, but I don't want you there if you don't want to be there. Uh, I'm going to make every F attempt to post my lecture PowerPoint slides online, preferably before class starts. I mean, I know students usually want the PowerPoint slides. If I can get them done, it's the first semester I'm teaching this, but if I if I can get my slides done, I will post them beforehand so you students can follow along with that. So I expect you to be in class taking notes, but now some people have, a lot of people have tablets, so you can bring up the PowerPoint lines and annotate on, the, on, the, on your tablet if you want. You can also keep notes in your notebook and look at my PowerPoint slides later, whatever you want to do. But I'm happy to give that that material available to you so you can follow along with my PowerPoints. And I, I will really try to post them if I have them done, but because I'm creating the course from scratch, uh, I can't promise how far ahead I will be. 
Uh, I'm going to, from time to time, post videos of myself solving homework problems. So that's something I would like to try. I've never really done that before. Um, but if there's a particularly interesting problem that we don't quite get to in class, I'm just going to record a video like this. I'll post it on my YouTube channel. Uh, and then you can actually see me working some problems there. And that way you can actually get some help. I may record problems that get solved with students during office hours. So if, if a group of students comes to me during my office hours and they all say, oh, can we just work through these problems? I might just record us doing that. And then I will also post that as well. So they have a record of how we solved it and the other people can maybe see that too. But I will not be recording my lectures. This is not an online course. This is not an internet distance based course. So I am not recording the lectures. I'm not recording what's happening in the, in the, in the lecture hall. And I'm not posting any recordings of any of those lecture materials. I will post frequent announcements on Brightspace, though. So anything which is announced in class is also announced on Brightspace at the same time for the people who do not attend lecture. If you do not attend lecture, you're not going to miss anything. I will be very, very clear through Brightspace. Hey, this is, uh, you know, a new assignment's been released, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you're receiving emails from Brightspace. That alerts you when new announcements have been made. Laboratory. Participation in the laboratory is a required portion of the course. It's worth 15% of your grade. Labs will not start in the first two weeks of class, and we will release a full lab schedule when we have it. So people always ask, do we have the lab the first day? No, we will not. Uh, we Our class starts on a Friday. There will be no labs on that Friday. There will be no labs the week after that first Friday. That's for sure. I'm not exactly sure yet when they start. Usually it's the third week. We will let you know. I promise you that. But that first week of full week of classes, you will not have labs. It will not be that early. Uh, all of the lab scheduling is announced by the lab coordinator, coder, lab coordinator, Mr. Aldo DiCarlo. You will get a separate Brightspace page for the lab part of your course. So be pay attention to that. When you log into your Brightspace, you should have a course for the lecture and that's I'm administering that and I'm sending you documents and I'm making announcements and you will have a Brightspace site for your lab section. All the laboratory materials are gonna be posted there. You're gonna communicate with your teaching assistant and Mr. DiCarlo through that separate lab Brightspace site. So make sure you're seeing both of them when it's created. That again is not gonna be probably by the first day of class. Those Brightspace sites for your labs will probably not be active yet. They will be coming and I will keep sending announcements reminding you, no lab this week, but be on the lookout for that, okay? Let's talk about academic integrity. Um, students are encouraged to work together during the semester for the purpose of discuss discussing assignments and during the labs, which are done in groups, for sure. Physics is not a solitary exercise. When you're working homework problems, you should work in a group. You should be getting help from friends, mentors, peers, whatever. However, when you submit work for grading, that work that you submit must be your own. Copying from other students for either course assignments or laboratory reports is not allowed. The use of internet resources, test banks, forums, CHEG, uh, Discord sites uh, for labs or assignments is also strictly prohibited. Those examples all constitute plagiarism. So I have a large section uh, in the Brightspace site. There's something called academic integrity, uh, just a resource. It'll be over in the left a column. And plagiarism and academic dishonesty, are, we consider them to be serious offenses and will be addressed using official university guidelines policies. So I've already posted academic integrity uh, things uh, at Brightspace. So you can read as much as you want about that. So you will not be able to say, oh, I didn't know that was cheating. I posted all that documentation. Yes, you did. Uh, so what are the academic expectations we have for you when you're doing your mastering physics assignments, you're going to answer the assignment questions by yourself using reasoning and mathematics that you have worked out on your own. That means that you didn't give your license to your brother-in-law and he's going through and posting in the answers for you. That would be academic misconduct. That is not your work. Um, the use of internet resources and test banks is plagiarism and will result in a score of zero if we can prove that you did it. Uh, that'll be a zero for the assignment and a report of academic misconduct filed with the dean. So we do take it seriously. So please try not to do that. Uh, any copying that we can prove from another student will result in zero for both students. Uh, students also think, well, I just lent my friend uh, some assignments or some answers and so I didn't do anything. No. You're both guilty of academic misconduct. So there's a zero for the person who copies and there's a zero for the person who lent their material to be copied. When you go into the lab, you will work in a group of three. So that's awesome. There's three of you working communally as a group, as a team, every week, a different team to submit a laboratory report that'll be worth uh, ultimately 15% of your lab course. 
However, our academic expectations for you in the lab are you each have to do your own pre-lab and turn in work in your pre-lab that you'll turn in at the beginning of class that you are claiming is yours. By turning that in for grade into your GA, you're saying, I did this work, I didn't copy it. It is our expectation you will perform all the experiments as described in your lab manual with your lab group in class at the time of the experiment. You will then prepare an original lab report that is an actual and accurate and honest description of the work you and your lab partners did in the lab during class time. Any other work that gets submitted, and we catch people doing this every single semester. If you use data from someone else's lab, if you use any portion of anyone else's lab report, if you're submitting absolutely anything you did not do or write, that's academic misconduct, that is plagiarism, and we're just going to deal with it very seriously. At a minimum, all the students in the group, if we catch you doing it, we're just going to ask you to leave the lab, and we're going to sign you a zero mark for the week. Uh, we'll make a note of cheating, and if possible, uh, we can lead to academic misconduct allegations filed with the dean. Uh, and just so you know, all lab reports that you submit are submitted to Brightspace, are scanned by what's called the integrated Turnitin software, and that compares everything you're submitting to the university this year and in every year since we've been using Brightspace, including that current semester. So if you're copying or using else's report, uh, Turnitin is uh, actually going to catch it. So it uses artificial intelligence, writing detection technology, and uh, it can distinguish between AI and human written text. It's already turning up uh, instances of that, and you're just going to get a zero. So note that all students in the group are treated the same. There's no difference between a group member who is actively copying cheating and the group members who allow it to occur. We have this happen every uh, happen every semester where one student shows up with a previously written, written uh, lab portion, uh, and then he or she tries to slip that into their lab report, and they just kind of plagiarize an entire paragraph. Guess what? The whole group gets a zero. And then we do have students come to us and say, I didn't know they were cheating. I didn't do it. You're still getting a zero. All group members are responsible for the behavior of the group. Because then we ask them, well, how did you not know they were cheating? Oh, well, I was working on this section of the lab. Yeah, that's a communal lab report. You're all getting a zero. So any instances of plagiarism detecting the lab report result in a zero being given to all group members. I'm just telling you that now. Uh, conversely, we have had some instances where maybe one student out of the group of three will come forward to the GA and say, hey, this guy was actually cheating. I tried to stop him or her. Uh, it just wasn't possible. So then we try to cheat, treat those people very leniently because they're actually doing the right thing and coming forward and say, yeah, I observed them cheating. I don't want any part of it. This is ridiculous. Is there something you can do about it? And then that, then there is. Uh, the GRT has the right to kick that student out of the lab, and then we can just grade the remaining students in the group based on the work that you're doing. So if you're seeing cheating in your randomly assigned lab groups, let us know. Get that person out of your group because you're going to get the zero too if we catch you and we will catch you. So just we take it seriously, guys. You have to do this work on your own. Um, it's it's kind of a really uh, bad problem right now. And but we're going to continue to insist on our standards that you're being graded on the work that you do. OK. Uh, there's a lot of resources the uni university has now for student mental health support. So here's a whole look at the last side of the page on uh, resources that you can use if you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, you need counseling, uh, you think like you're having mental health issues, please reach out for help. Uh, the first semester can be overwhelming for you guys. There's going to be, you're kind of going from, oh, I was in grade 12 at high school, uh, not so not so much work. Then you had the summer off and then come September, we're just throwing you into a boiling pot of water. And you've got five courses, maybe very stressful. Uh, there's a lot going on. It's easy to lose. Uh, you're mooring and you kind of feel a little bit ungrounded and like things are happening too quickly and there's too much stress. Well, there is help for you uh, and do reach out and get the help if you need it. Um, I have a statement here on what we define as sexual misconduct. So from the University of Windsor policy on sexual misconduct, look, the university values dignity, respect, and equality for all individuals, and we have to foster an atmosphere of healthy attitudes and behavior uh, towards all sexuality, uh, sex, and gender. So any form of sexual misconduct, and that could be if I see it in class, verbal harassment through uh, online, through our discussion pages, any kind of non-consensual contact, online harassment in class harass uh, harassment, any uh, non-consensual sharing of image, whatever is 
these are all things that can jeopardize the mental, physical, and emotional welfare of our students, and uh, that will be reported. So if I observe any of it, if you guys think it's happening to you, because obviously I'm probably not going to see most of these things if they occur, but if, if this happens to you, and I, I have dealt with instances of this in the past where you feel like you're being harassed in class, please talk to me. There's a lot I can do for you, and if it's just a person who's bugging you, I can make them move in the lecture hall. I have the authority to do that. I have the authority to talk to uh, the, uh, the U Windsor's office of uh, there's a, a sexual misconduct response and prevention office. I can talk to them. Uh, we can help you out. It can all be confidential, but you have to come talk to me first. Uh, we do take it very seriously, um, you know, and I will work with you because we, you absolutely have the right. The, look, the vast majority of you guys, you know, you're here for the right reasons. You want to learn. You're excited to be at university. You just want to come to class. Think about physics for that 50 minutes as much as you can. You don't want to have to be bothered by people pestering you online or some creepy person who's like sitting around you or making uh, comments that you don't particularly enjoy hearing. There's no reason you have to sit through that. We are here for the right reasons. You let me know. You and I will work together and we'll make sure that you're learning in an environment where you feel comfortable and safe. And it's, it's absolutely uh, an expectation you should have. But if you don't tell me, there's nothing I can do about it, but we can work on that. Um, there will be student evaluation of teaching forms at the end in the final two weeks of the semester. Here's this SAS, so student accessibility services. There's a variety of services and support to students if you have documented disabilities, and this is learning disabilities, ADHD, acquired brain injuries, you have vision issues, hearing, mobility, impairments, depression, anxiety, chronic medical conditions, psychiatric issues, things which will impede uh, your uh, ability to complete the course uh, in a timely way. We the, that that office, the SAS office, is the office that you will deal with, and then they will work to make accommodations for you so you are given the support that you need to do as well, every opportunity to do as well in this course as every other student. Uh, you should inform me, but most importantly, the SAS at the beginning of the course if you need to be using SAS services this semester. But talk talk to both of us. This should be done well in advance of the examinations. If You, you cannot just go into SAS like if we have an exam on Wednesday. You can't drop in on Monday and say, oh, I have ADHD. I need some more time. It, that's that's way too late. Uh, you should be talking to them before classes even start. Uh, you know, they will work with you and they'll they'll talk to you about, you know, whatever diagnosis you have. Uh, they'll talk, they'll want to see some medical documentation and then they'll get a file open with you. They communicate with me. All kinds of accommodations can be granted, but you work with them early. Okay, guys, as early as you can. Uh, course materials, all this stuff I have some of them posting are the intellectual property, the IP of me. And they are protected by copyright laws. So that's if uh, if if any lectures get streamed, which I'm not going to do, but we have that statement in there for the online courses, lecture notes, PowerPoint slides, course assignments, exams, anything that I post online, all of this IP is mine, and they are not for redistribution, resale, or profit. I own the IP. You do not have the right to take them and post them in any other way, uh, you do, without permission of me. So you just can't do that. You are of course allowed to download them and look at them. You just can't reuse them for anything. And there you go. That is the last page of that syllabus. Um, so there's a lot that we went over in there. Again, for those of you who are new to university, this is what a syllabus should be like. If it seems like a lot of detail, there is a lot of detail, but you need to be completely clear on how this course is going to be run. That is the expectation you should have for every one of your classes. All right, so now I wanted to go through the schedule such as it is for the first semester. Again, this is tentative, um, but this is what it looks like right now. All right, so it says tentative FIS 1400 uh, section one schedule for fall 2023. Uh, again, I've never taught this course before here at the University of Windsor. I have taught similar courses before. So I'm a little uncertain how the schedule is gonna go, but I think it'll look something like this. Uh, so you see we're spending roughly three to four class periods per chapter. There we go. Usually it's in case of chapter two, it's like four class periods. Chapter three, it's three class periods. So it's roughly a chapter a week would be a rough way to uh, say how we're doing it. Uh, we're going to get through chapters one through four, which is Newton's Laws of Motion. This should all be for review for you guys who had a really good uh, – SPH for you experience in high school, this stuff should all be review. And so if you're sailing through all that first month of class and you're like, this is great. I learned this really well at my previous high school. That's great. I, I hope that's true. It's setting you up to do really well on the assignment, uh, on the exam. Then we're then going to have a week off for the reading week. And then when, when we return from the week after reading week, we're going to have the first midterm, which is going to cover all of this material. So tentatively, I have October 20th, which is a Friday, scheduled for our first midterm. 
Uh, then we're getting into chapter five. Looks like another three class periods on chapter five, three class periods on chapter seven, three class periods on chapter eight, conservation of energy, uh, three class periods of chapter nine, linear momentum and collisions. And then tentatively, we've got our second in-class midterm scheduled for Friday, November 17th. And that should cover all the material that went before it. Then we're going to get into uh, rotational motion, three class periods. Looks like three class periods on angular momentum and general rotations, and then three class periods on oscillations and cyclic harmonic motion. That gets us to December 6th, the last day of class, and that's it. We will have a final exam when the university tells us when it is, and that will be cumulative. The final exams are usually cumulative, meaning it's everything we covered over the course of the entire semester uh, dropped into one three-hour class period. So there's a reason that the final exam is 40% of the grade. It's three hours. All the rest of our in-class midterm, so this will be written in class then, so that means it's 50 minutes. We have to have it start at 1130. It's got to be done by 1220. But for the final exam, we've got three whole hours. So it's obviously going to be a longer assessment uh, and it's worth uh, more of the weight of your exam. So this is kind of what I have for now. Uh, I, I think it's probably pretty close to what the final schedule will look like. As I said, uh, I, I have, I reserve the right to change anything in the syllabus or the schedule up till the first day of class. I'm required to have this kind of worked out by the first day of class. And then I have, I think, seven to 14 days once class starts to actually finalize all of those documents. But uh, with any luck, by the first day of class, the schedule and syllabus will be finalized. In all the years I've been teaching, uh, I've never really had to change anything uh, once the class actually gets launched. Um, so, but this just gives us a little time through August to make sure that uh, everything is exactly where we want it to be. So there you go. That was kind of a uh, long, deep dive uh, into that syllabus. You can see why I did not want to do this on the first day of class. When we meet on the first day of class, I don't know, I've got like five or 10 minutes, maybe not more to go over the syllabus. And I will be pointing everyone else then to watch this video. So if you wanna get ahead on the course, watch it before classes start, then you know exactly what's going on. Um, I think that just makes sense to me. We clearly don't have time to go through this line by line in class, but now you have all the time in the world to just slowly watch this video, make sure you understand everything. And if you have any questions, then you can ask me about it at a later date. So that's my vision of how the class is going to be run. I hope that makes a lot of sense to you. I hope that kind of gives you a better impression of how this course is going to go. Obviously, you'll have a lot more questions. There will be more information forthcoming for sure. Uh, as I know more, I will release more. Uh, and as you have your questions, I'm sure you will bring them to me. And these questions will naturally arise as we move towards the first day of class. So, But I hope you start off here. Get those documents, save the PDFs, uh, realize they're only a draft version. If I post updates, please get rid of the old ones so you're not confused and get the newest versions and we'll go forward from there. So that's all I have for you now. Uh, I hope this video was helpful to you and I look forward to talking with you more in the future. All right, thanks very much guys. Talk to you soon.